and you'll cooperate, you'll read, share with me all the passages we are going to look into. Can I trust you for that? Yeah. The Lord has trusted you already. Yeah. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name for our leaders, our brothers and sisters, our pastors and overseers, everyone present here and in all the various places we are linked together to enjoy your work together. We are praying, Lord, that you touch every life and transform our leadership in Jesus' name. Help us that every little thing, every minute thing, every verse you help us to look into will be a blessing to everyone in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Make us source of blessings to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Titus chapter 1. Tonight, as we look at Titus chapter 1, we're going to do something that may look peculiar to uh, many of us. I'm looking at Titus chapter 1 verse 4. It says to Titus, My own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. As you look at that verse, you'll find the apostle by inspiration is praying for Titus. And this is what we call a pastoral epistle. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are pastoral epistles. That means these epistles were written to pastors because Timothy and Titus were pastors, teachers, overseers of churches, a group of churches actually. And you notice in this prayer, as it refers to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, he brings the three elements in the prayer. Number one, grace. Number two, mercy. Number three, peace. And he says, all these three coming from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, it is um, only in the pastoral epistles we find these three blessings manifested, pronounced upon the pastors. Come to First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, number one, grace, number two, mercy, Number three, peace from God and our Lord, from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. You come to Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, number one, grace, number two, mercy, number three, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As you look at all the other epistles of uh, Paul the Apostle, uh, you start from Romans. Why don't you just uh, go through very briefly and very quickly. You are going to find that he has grace and peace and the mercy is missing within. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7. It says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to the saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians chapter 1. In First Corinthians chapter 1, again we're looking at uh, the prayer he prayed for them at Corinth. We're looking at chapter 1 verse 3, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The point is, he included the mercy when he was writing to the uh, pastors. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 2, Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 1, it tells us in Galatians chapter 1, when he prayed for them, in verse 3, Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. You go from Galatians, you come to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, 
and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're now in Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1. Here we're reading from verse uh, 3 to verse 2. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We're now in Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verse 2. It says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're now in First Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 2. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we come to the pastoral epistle. And as we come to the pastoral epistle, it's uh, going to include the mercy. Because he now tells us in First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, tell me the next word there, mercy and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As he writes the second epistle to Timothy, he's still including the mercy because in Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And what we're looking at today, Titus chapter 1 verse 4 to Titus, my own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. As you read all this, well, why don't you complete the, pastor, the epistles of Paul, Philemon, Philemon chapter 1, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As we come to Hebrews, there's no uh, greeting there. There is that uh, prayer that he prayed at the beginning was not, it's not there. And so, as we look at the uh, titles, then you are wondering uh, to these uh, pastors, praying for them uh, and praying especially for grace and praying especially for mercy and praying especially for peace to be upon uh, these uh, pastors. Tonight, we're looking at God's daily provision for ministers. God's daily provision for ministers. Really, if you were to think of the human mind, if you were not thinking of the inspiration of the scriptures, you would have thought mercy should have been included when writing to the, uh, um, to the Corinthians because those Corinthians, they needed a lot of mercy. And you think about the Galatians too. You would have thought that if any addition is going to be made to the grace and the peace stuck in there in the middle, it should have gone to the Galatians too. But no, in God's own wisdom, these pastors were the people that actually had the grace and the mercy and the peace. But why? The responsibility and the duties the challenges and the pressures of ministry, the care and the concern for souls, the battle and the fight against error and against falsehood. When you think about the weight of ministry in the church and the weight of mission to the world, they were so demanding that we had to raise a voice where Paul the Apostle saying, and who is sufficient for these things? Think about Timothy. Who is sufficient for these things? And think about Titus. Who is sufficient for these things? And the answer comes from Paul the Apostle himself. By the Spirit, our sufficiency is of God. You are not sufficient for the task ahead of you. But your sufficiency is of God. And God will equip you. And God will empower you. And God will give you all the grace you need, all the mercy you need, and all the peace you need in the mighty name of Jesus. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the sufficiency of God's grace in ministry. The sufficiency of God's grace 
in ministry. Number two, the sustenance of God's mercy through the mediator. The sustenance of God's mercy through the mediator. Point number three, the sanctuary of God's peace in the mind. Your mind becomes a sanctuary where the peace of God is reigning. And where the peace of God is ruling, the sanctuary of God's peace in the mind. We're coming to number one. As you come to number one, we're looking at Titus chapter one, verse four. It says to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. I know that uh, many of us, uh, well, everybody knows about grace. But you know, when we talk about grace, we talk about grace for the sinner. God will forgive you. And that's true. The grace of God is so wide, it's so deep, it's so broad, it's so high, that whoever you are, wherever you are coming from, the grace of God will have mercy on you and then you'll be forgiven. That's true. And then when we come to the Christian life, you're a Christian, now you're born again, you're a child of God. All the challenges of temptation, all the trials you may have, the grace of God is sufficient. It will carry you through. That is true. But you understand, this that we're reading here, this is grace for the minister. Many people do not realize that it's not just grace for the sinner to bring you into the kingdom and grace for the sage to make you righteous and holy. This is grace for the servant of God. This is grace for the minister. And you're wondering, uh, this supply of grace and this supply of favor, you're wondering about this benefit and this strength, this endowment referred to here for the minister. What was it for? Look at this. It was number one, uh, grace to be able to set things in order. That's a challenge. You're a minister, you're a pastor, and you're called to set things in order. That means things are disorderly. That means things are not the way they ought to be. That means there are some people, there are some preachers, and there are some workers, and there are some members who are behind the disorderliness and the grace to have the courage to set things in order. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Titus, I've let you increase that you will set things in order and that demands grace. Not only that, and to appoint ministers, to appoint elders in every city. How do you do that? You have to travel around to go to those cities. And you have to look at the church, to look at uh, those people. And then you have to choose one. There might be a Caleb as well as a Joshua. And then you are going to pick only one Joshua. And you are going to leave the Caleb. And you are, not going to, you are just appointing one leader, one pastor in a church. And then there are some people on the side of Caleb. There are some other people on the side of Joshua. And they say, what has Catus come? here to do. How could he pick just Joshua? How about Caleb? Look at the utterance of Caleb. Look at the con consecration of Caleb. And you need grace to hear all that and still to stand firm like a rock. Look at chapter 1 verse 6. If any be blameless and then you look at all the qualifications and then to be thorough as we're looking at people, as we're selecting people, that requires grace. You cannot just like, go there if you don't have a real mind if you don't have strength of character and if you don't have the courage and the grace and the strength to be able to say look at this, this say this right in your family, say that right in your family and then it tells us in verse 13, look at verse 13 it says this witness is true wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith you come to, he was not there before. It was like a new overseer. It was like a new leader coming there. I've just appointed you Titus and I placed you there. A lot of things are wrong over there, Titus. And therefore, you're going to set things in order and you're going to find some people who are kind of on the wrong side of the cross, on the wrong side of Calvary. You rebuke them sharply. No wonder he needed grace. If you're going to do all that in the church, 
that the Lord has sent you to, for you to have the backbone, for you to have the mind and the courage, you need that grace. Not only that, if you look at verse 14, it says, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. There were people in, that, in the Crete, not only in one local church, in all the churches in that province of Crete, that the commandments of men, the traditions of men, the superstition, the syncretism, that's what they were after. And now for Titus to come and to say, you know, this one is not gospel. You know, this one is not a new covenant. You know, this one is not according to the will of God. We're going to remove this. We're going to replace that with this. And they were used to a lot of things they normally do in their services and the Titus is going to say no you can't do that we're suspending that we're removing that we're taking away that and then some people that's where they have their joy and that's where they have all their satisfaction in ministry now if you remove this what do I do if you remove that what do I do if you remove that what do I do and then Titus needed the grace of God to be able to start to say no all those are commandments of men and we're not going to continue look at chapter 2 verse 1 it says in chapter 2 verse 1 but speak thou the things would become sound doctrine in the midst of a people say whatever they wanted to say preaching without preparation and just uh, being haphazard and for Titus now to come and lay line upon line and precept to home precept, it needs the grace of God. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Titus, grace unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ our Savior. Look at uh, chapter 2 verse 7. It says, in all things, this demands grace, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing on corruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that that cannot be condemned, that he which of the contrary part may be ashamed, having uh, no evil thing to say of you. That takes the grace of God. That, that one you cannot do in a natural strength, natural human effort. This takes the very grace of God that in all things, what does that mean in all things? In your ability to, in your, every area of your life, you are a pattern of good works, a pattern of sound doctrine unto the people. He needed grace, and we need grace for you to carry out everything the Lord has called you to that needs grace. Look at verse 9. Exhort the servants to be obedient unto their own masters. I'm sure you know that needs grace because it's not natural for servants to want to obey. There's the culture of disobedience and the culture of rebellion in the workplace. There is a culture of, you know, self-will. I'm going to have my way. And here Titus is going to go to all those churches in Crete. He was a new overseer. He was a new person in their midst. And was to come and tell them, you know, this culture of rebellion is in the workplace, we're going to cancel it. This culture of uh, working to rule and uh, not working when the master is not there, this culture of eye service, we're going to stamp it out. And it takes the grace of God. That's why Paul the Apostle, before he wrote all this to him, to say, Titus, I left you there in Crete to set in order the things that are wanting there. You're going to do this and this and this. He says, uh, before I go on, grace unto you. And before we go on tonight, grace unto you. Yeah. More grace in your life. Yeah. That God will help you to do and to be everything he has called you to be, everything he has called you to do in Jesus' name. Look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. There were peculiarities in Crete as to, you know, what constituted sin and what constituted opposition to righteousness and godly living. It's like in our day now, as we look at the area of internet, as we look at the area of IT, as we look at the area of a profession, as we look at the area of economy, as we look at the area of community, community living, you're going to see peculiar things there that God is challenging. You're going to pinpoint them and you're going to say, no, this is sin. God has called us to live godly lives and righteous life in this present world. In verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Tell me the rest there. 
zealous of good works. What do you do, Titus? Because as you go to that church, the people, they're sold on their business. And they want to, you know, carry on this. They're sold on success. They're sold on extramoral education. They're sold on this and that. And then for the work of God, there's no zeal. They're lethargic. They're lukewarm. And now, Titus, you cannot just say, why was I sent to a place like this? Look at these people. They're not interested in the coming of the Lord. They're not interested in, uh, you know, being zealous for the Lord. It's only they go after they get to go, they go to their farm, they go to their industry, they go everywhere. Titus, that's why you are there. And it needs grace for you to bring all those people back and make them zealous of good works. I'm looking at chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in remembrance. Put them in mind to be subject unto principalities and powers and to obey majesty and to be ready for every good work. That's exactly what they were not ready for. All those people, they were against constituted authority. That is, they were against good governance. They were against, you know, somebody staying there as their emperor, somebody staying there as president, somebody staying there as king, and then following constitution and telling us, pay your tax and do this and do this. The people were against that. And Titus now was to come and was to tell the people, we must be law abiding. We must obey obey the magistrates, we must obey the leadership in the family, leadership in the school, and leadership in the community. This takes the grace of God. That's why, as Paul the Apostle wrote to him, he said, you know what you're going to do? Here are the responsibilities. Here are the great duties you are going to perform. It needs grace, and I'm praying for you. Grace unto you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with what? With all authority, let no man despise thee. Do you understand? You know, a new leader comes, a new overseer comes. I was looking at him. What's he going to bring out of the pocket? What's he going to do that, you know, the other leaders who were there before did not do? And what's he going to, and they wanted to dispense it. Now, um, Titus, you're going to go there. I've left you there. I've left you there. If I were there, I will rebuke them with all authority. I'm not going to allow anyone to kind of disrespect me or belittle me or look down on the authority I have as a servant of God and as the one that is called of God to set everything in order. And Titus, I'm telling you the same thing, that you will rebuke with all authority anything that needs to be reproved or needs to be rebuked and you'll not allow them to shun you, to push you away and to disregard you and then to despise your authority. It tells us in chapter 3 and verse 2, it says uh, to speak evil of no man uh, and to be no brawlers uh, but to be gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Say Titus, you know I've been to that place, if even their poets, even their writers, even their secular people, they say that the uh, Grecians they are talkatives, they are liars they talk, talk, talk and talk, talk, talk and there is no value and there is nothing there is no substance in the things they are saying and you are going there you are not just preaching salvation by grace, yes we preach that tell us the consequence of that salvation you are not just telling us there is a second work of grace, sanctification and holiness of heart and life tell us the practical implication of that, you are not just telling us that the baptism and power in the Holy Ghost, tell them this thing will change their tongue, will change their language, will change their disposition. And then it goes on in verse 8, it says in verse 8, this is a faithful scene, and what and these uh, things I will that thou affirm constantly. Affirm constantly. And you know, there are some people, if you affirm something now, then they, they come the next time and they say, we hope he's not going to say that again. And then T titles, that's exactly what you're going to say again. Affirm constantly. They come again until they get it, until they understand it, until it gets to their heart and their lives are totally influenced and informed and totally transformed. Affirm 
constantly. What's he affirming constantly? Affirm that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. There are some people, we we'll call them antinomians. They're anti law antinomian means that they're against the law of God. They're against the righteousness. And they say, we're saved by grace. Good works are nothing. You must affirm constantly that they maintain good works. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Now, all these will require grace. That's why the Lord is telling us. That's why the Lord is giving us this at the beginning of the epistle. Grace unto you. All this the Lord has called you to. I pray that you have the grace to do it. Church work is not for lazy people. Church work is not for fearful people. Church work is not for timid people. Church work is not for people that don't have any backbone. You know, if, if some people think that if you are a failure in any other area, come to church and come and be a pastor. Some people feel that if you cannot make it as a farmer, you cannot make it as a teacher, you cannot make it in any other profession, go to church and be a pastor, then you'll find a good place there. They think that pastoral work is for people that are spineless, the people that do not have courage, the people that do not have any understanding and the people that do not have anything they can think about, they cannot develop strategy, they cannot do this or that then go to church is for people who are failures, no the church is not like that, the best is good for the almighty God, I said the best is good for the almighty God and if you have a you know, good brain you're a good candidate for the work of God, good mind, you're a good candidate for the work of God and you have a good backbone, courage and stamina and you're going to stand for the truth and you're going to call sinners to come to know the Lord you're a good candidate, welcome and you will succeed in Jesus name the point I'm making is the grace that is referred to here is not grace for sinners. It's not grace for ordinary members. This is grace for the minister. Actually, Paul the Apostle mentioned that over and over. He said there is grace for the minister. It's not just, uh, you know, for unbelievers. And it's not just for, you know, believers, uh, ordinary believers. I'm reading uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. You see that? We receive grace and apostleship. The apostleship we received, that is to minister an apostle, it requires grace. And then he goes on to say, for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Look at uh, Romans chapter 15. Grace necessary for ministers. Grace important for ministers. In uh, Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 15, nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, as putting you in mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God. The grace that is given to me. What's the grace for? Verse 16, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul the Apostle said, being a minister requires grace. And the work I'm doing, ministering to the Gentiles, I needed so much grace to do that. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. To build the church, you need grace. To be a wise master builder, you need grace. And to be able to develop people, build them up, build their families up, and build their their Christian lives up, we need grace as ministers, according to the grace which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation that requires grace, another builders thereon, and let every man that take heed how he buildeth thereupon, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, 
G, which is Jesus Christ. We're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. It requires grace to do the work effectively. It requires grace to do the work, and then it grows. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He says it's not just because I was saved. Yes, I needed grace for salvation. Not just because I was sanctified. I needed grace for sanctification. But for service. For service. He says I am. He says I am what I am. By the grace of God. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. He's telling us that you know in the labor, in the service, in the ministry, in the preaching, in the evangelization. He says, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but what is that? But grace, the grace of God, which was with me. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is grace peculiar to the minister. This is grace specially given to the minister. This is grace that every minister needs. And it is not just, a, you know, grace for Christian living. Yes, that's there. Grace for salvation, that's there. And grace to overcome temptation, that's there. But grace now to live and to labor in the kingdom of God. For 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. You see that? And not fleshly wisdom, the people that will try to do the work, the way they do secular work, they transfer the wisdom, the understanding, the administration they use in secular work, they transfer to the church work. And there are some people, the way they taught in the you know, secular, they transfer that to the ministry. It's more than that, because it says, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had a conversation in the world more abundantly to your word. For we write none of other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. You'll acknowledge to the end. I look at uh, chapter 12, chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're reading from verse 9. It demands grace. There are challenges that will demand grace. There are pressures that will demand grace. There are things that will come that will demand grace. And there are difficulties in ministry, crossroads in ministry, conflicts in ministry, and the pressures that come that will demand the grace of God. Look at chapter 12, verse 9. He said, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. There are times you wonder, Do I have strength to carry through this? This, do I have strength to do this? And then God is saying, remember the need of grace. Do you remember the place of grace? Remember the strength that comes to you through grace? And he says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what grace does for the minister. The power of God will rest upon you. The power of God will saturate you. And the power of God will hold you up. And then you'll stand on solid ground. And whatever wind may be blowing. And whatever conflicts may arise. You are able to stand. And you are going to stand. You understand now as a minister. You go to God. You are saved already. You are, you are sanctified already. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost already. But now you have challenges ahead of you. And you have pressures upon you. And you have things that might uh, kind of make you weak that you cannot do what you ought to do you go to God in prayer you're asking for strength you're asking for grace and as you ask the Lord will strengthen you and then the things that have made you to want to say maybe I'll pack it up maybe I'll pack my Lord maybe I cannot be in preach maybe I cannot be in charge of all these churches to be an overseer in this province what a challenge this is as the grace of God comes to you you will rise up again you do the work and you do it with all your heart and all your strength. And everything that tried to maybe weaken you before, you'll be stronger than them in Jesus' name. Look at verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure. It says, now I'm not complaining. You'll not complain anymore. 
I'm not grumbling. You'll not grumble anymore. You'll not murmur anymore. It says, therefore, I take pleasure. What's the therefore for? It says, because I find more grace. And his grace is sufficient for me. It says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution. I even take pleasure in that, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, tell me, say it for yourself. Say it from that, from, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Grace is coming. More grace is coming. Greater grace is coming. And in place of every form of weakness, you are going to be strong, stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for, uh, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard, if ye have heard, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, to your word. Then he says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore, in few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles shall be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of, of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of, tell me, the grace of God. You know what he realized? He realized that all the opportunities he had by the grace of God. And he says, partakers of his promise in Christ. And he says, I'm not made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, unto me. Can you think about this? Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you see, he depended on, so much on the grace of God. And as he talked to Timothy, he said, Timothy, you know what has carried me through is the grace of God. You know what will carry you through is the grace of God. You have the tendency to yield to intimidation. And Timothy, you know what? Go to Christ. When you're weak, go to Christ. When you're intimidated, go to Christ. When you feel discouraged, go to Christ. And when it appears you cannot take another step, go to Christ. Grace will come unto you. And so it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading here from verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, tell me, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's how to be strong, more grace will come. Today, he'll give you more grace. And if you're weak, you'll be strong. I said you will be strong. You'll be strong in the grace of God in Jesus' name. Look, look, at, look at this in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20. Wherefore? We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. We receiving, it's talking to believers. It's talking to ministers. Already he understands we're in the ministry. And it says we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have, what are we going to have? Grace. Whereby we may do what? Serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That tells us then we need the grace of God. More grace, greater grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace, so that will be everything he has called us to be. We're coming to point number two now. The sustainers of God's mercy through the mediator. The sustainers of God's mercy through the mediator. We're coming now to uh, chapter one of Titus and we're reading from verse four. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
our Savior. We come now to the area of mercy. Because Paul the Apostle is telling Titus, mercy from God, mercy from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is mercy for the minister. This is divine compassion for the minister in God. Uh, there's one thing you, you need to understand to start with. Mercy and truth are inseparably joined together. And what God has joined together, no man can put asunder. Uh, let, let's uh, emphasize that to start with, that mercy and truth are joined together. You cannot just say, I want to show mercy, and there's no truth. You cannot say, I want to show mercy, there's no sound doctrine. You cannot say, I want to show mercy, and then there is no fact about the mercy you are showing mercy and truth go together and they are separable. We're looking at uh, Psalm 25 verse 10. Psalm 25 verse 10, all the parts of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. At the titles, you are going to have the mercy of God remain in the truth, remain in the truth. All the parts of the Lord are mercy and truth. Psalm 85, I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 85, we're reading from verse 10. In Psalm 85, reading here from verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It's telling us that, you know, you want the mercy of God. We're talking about the ministers now. And the ministers that want the mercy of God shown unto them, they are going to have mercy and truth. Psalm 86, verse 15. In Psalm 86, verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous, in mercy and truth mercy and truth you cannot isolate mercy you know show mercy show mercy show mercy how about the truth how about the falsehood there we need to take the falsehood away we need to take the error away we need to take the false doctrine away and then you have mercy and truth in uh, psalm 89 verse 14 Psalm 89 verse 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Mercy and truth. Psalm 100, we're looking at verse 5. 100, we're looking at verse 5. Here it says in verse 5, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And so as we talk about uh, the mercy of God, we're talking about the truth of God as well. And we're talking about the sound doctrine that ought to be part of the life of the minister. If, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are some people that uh, they might teach uh, false doctrine and then they're not abiding by the truth of the word of God and say, please, uh, you know, stay aside. You don't, you're confusing the people. You're not telling us about repentance and faith before you talk about salvation you're just saying come 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 god will love god loves everybody and there's no repentance go and sit down and then after the fellow has prayed for a day or two he comes back and then he say you know you can see from the facial appearance he's trying to put up uh, you know some things he says uh, pastor mercy pastor mercy and i'm saying my friend truth is saying mercy. I say truth. Let's join everything together. Let mercy come halfway and let truth come this way and let them meet at the middle. And when truth and mercy have met together, then we can move forward. There must be truth. I said there must be truth. We cannot have sentimental mercy without the truth of God in the life of the minister. All men need God's mercy, but ministers like Timothy, ministers like Titus, need the mercy of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we talk about the mercy, what does the mercy do? And what does the mercy bring in our lives as ministers? We are coming now to Luke chapter 1. And you will see what the truth, uh, what's been revealed about the mercy that we're expecting. It tells us in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 72. Mercy, what does it bring? What does it do? What does it accomplish? And what does it uh, flow? How does it flow into your life? In Luke chapter 1, verse 72, 
to perform the mercy, look at that, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which is swear to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him, how? Without fear, but 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. What the mercy of God does in our lives, it brings that holiness and it brings that righteousness into our lives. What we couldn't do by ourselves before, the mercy of God brings that righteousness and that holiness. Now, number two, look at verse 78, through the tender mercy of our God tender mercy of our God. What does that mercy do? Whereby the day spring from on high has visited us. Look at verse 79. It says, to give light to them that sit in darkness. That's what the mercy of God does. Light to them that are in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. You see, Titus, you need guidance. The mercy of God will do that. Titus, you need the light. In the midst of the, uh, the Christian uh, darkness, you need light. And the mercy of God will do that. We're coming to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 23. The mercy of God. What that mercy does. In Romans chapter 9, verse 23, it says, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. It says in the mercy of God that will reveal to you the depths and the height and the length and the breadth of the riches of the glory of God. So that you're going from one depth to another depth to another depth is giving you revelations you couldn't have by yourself. And Titus, you need that in Crete because as you're setting things in order, the Lord will show you this and show you this and as you're appointed people, the Lord will show you this and show you this, and it is the mercy of God that does that. That's why he's praying for Titus grace and mercy from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to Romans chapter 15 verse 9. Romans chapter 15 verse 9. What the mercy of God does in the life of the minister, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. The Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this cause, uh, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he says, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles and lodge him all ye people. It grants us the joy of salvation for the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the pagans, the people that are idol worshippers, you never even thought that they will be able to receive the gospel. And God sends you there. And as you go there, he opens your mouth and he declares through you the verities of the gospel. And many people are coming to the Lord and are granted salvation with the joy of salvation. That's what he's talking about, the mercy of God that sends us to them and makes us effective in their lives. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, therefore, seeing we receive this ministry, it says, as we have received mercy, we faint not, strength instead of fainting. Courage, instead of crumbling, instead of being crushed under the weight of persecution, under the weight of difficulty, under the weight of every conflict, but it gives you strength. Instead of fainting, you know, you're moving on when you should have, you know, be, you know, relaxing and going back home saying, it's too much, I cannot bear it anymore. It is the mercy of God that keeps you on and gives you the strength. Look at verse 16, you know, for which cause we faint not because of this mercy that came to us and it says, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed 
day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal wage of glory. It is the mercy of God that makes you to have the right interpretation all the persecution, all the pressure, and then to say this light affliction. In fact, it's the mercy of God that makes you have verse 18. What we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are not seen are eternal. For the Lord to shift your focus away from the temporal, away from the things that are, you know, of the moment, and to shift your focus to life eternal, and the things things eternal. That's the mercy of God right there walking in your life. It tells us, it also blesses us of the riches of grace. In, um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 4. Look at what the mercy of God brings into our lives as ministers. It says in chapter 2 verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, where we say love does, even when we are dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ by grace. Are you saved? Give me a good amen there. But six, and he has raised us up. This part of the mercy, and this is the result of the mercy of God in our lives. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's saying you are not even just sitting down there in the world. He has raised you up. His mercy, you didn't merit that. It, there was a demerit in your life, and yet he looked at away from all the demerits and he raised you up to sit down together. In heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ, that in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards God through Jesus Christ in the mercy of God. And I pray that that mercy will come more and more in your life in Jesus' name. Look at another aspect now of the mercy of God in Philippians chapter 2, verse 27. Philippians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 27. It says, For indeed he was sick, nice unto death, but God had mercy on him. This is mercy. This is mercy. And Paul, the apostle, was talking of another minister, and he says, This minister became sick. He was so sick unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. When somebody has been sick, a fellow minister, and then we're very concerned, we need him, we need her. At this time, this is not the time for her to go home to glory, or for him to go home to glory. And we pray, and we pray, and then the Lord answers our prayer like he's going to answer our prayers for you. I said he'll answer our prayers for you. And then you are healed, you become healed and hearty, you jump up and then you are into the ministry again and we say, the Lord had mercy on him and the Lord had mercy on us so that we will not have sorrow upon sorrow. You see, there are various aspects and there are various ramifications of the mercy of God upon the minister. That's why Paul was telling Titus, he says, grace unto you. And I say grace unto you. And he said, mercy unto you. And I'm saying mercy unto you. Look at, look at verse 20, 28. And I, I sent him therefore. The more carefully that when you see him again, he may rejoice that I may have, I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore, it's just got well now and is coming back into the ministry. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such a reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nice unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And then not only that, uh, let, let's look at uh, what God does. We're looking at Second uh, Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1 uh, and verse 18. Second Timothy 
chapter 1 I'm reading here from verse 18 in verse 18 it says the Lord grant him that he may find mercy of the Lord the mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well he's talking about the full favor we're going to have on the final day he says that's mercy also that's mercy also that God will make you to finish well you are going to finish well what are you there? I said you are going to finish well. You'll finish well in Jesus' name. And then on the final day, he'll give you final, final favor and well done. He says, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. You will find it in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, the mercy of God also helps. So whatever situation you have challenged your family, the mercy of God will bail you out. And then in your place of work, the mercy of God will help you through. And in the church work, the mercy of God will help you through. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly. How do we come? Are we going to receive? Is he going to help us? Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain, what are we obtaining? Obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's why Paul the apostle was praying for Timothy, for Titus and for Timothy also. And he said, mercy of God and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ upon you. And this is the mercy that even keeps us, it keeps our hope lively keeps our hope lively and all the things that will pull down your faith and your hope and your love everything will be crushed and sent away from your life in jesus name first peter first peter chapter one i'm reading from verse three first peter chapter one verse three it says blessed be god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. It says, you know, there are people who are, who are serving the Lord, they are ministering, but a lot of times they live under doubt, and they live under depression, and they live under duress and distress. And they are saying, well, I'm doing this now. What if I do all this and at the final day and the end, what should in case I've missed my way somewhere, I've missed my steps somewhere, and the joy of service is not there and the hope of glory is not there it is the mercy of god that keeps us alive in the hope of the lord and we're sure beyond any shadow of doubt when the trumpet sounds we're going to be there as the dead in christ rise and then we which are alive were caught up together with them to be in the clouds you'll be there i'll be there I said, you'll be there, I'll be there. And it is the mercy of God that gives us that assurance in our heart because it says in that verse, three, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Are you going to be there? Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Jude, only one chapter. Jude, reading from verse 21. Jude, we're reading from verse 21. It says in Jude verse 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the mercy, in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. As you are walking for the Lord and serving the Lord, you're looking for the mercy of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a difference, and others sit with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hitching even the garments spotted by the flesh, now unto him that is unto him that is tell me out aloud unto him that is able to keep you from falling i'll see you next time you'll say be standing i'll see you next time you'll say be victorious because our god is able to keep you he'll keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. amen. That amen will be fulfilled in your life. We come to point number three now, the sanctuary of God's peace in the mind. The sanctuary of God's peace in the mind. We're coming to Titus chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 4. Titus chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 4. In Titus chapter 1, reading here from verse uh, from verse 4. Here it says to Titus, My own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Here Paul the Apostle was saying, This is my ministration to you. This is my intercession for you. This is my prayer for you that you'll have grace, abundant grace, sufficient grace. You will have mercy. You will have unique and universal uh, mercy. The mercy of God that will infiltrate and saturate every area of your life. And then you have the peace of God. As we talk about the peace here, we understand when you get saved, there is peace in salvation. Because now, he has given us, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And he is our peace because we have made reconciliation with the Lord. But we are going to be beyond that now. That's for the believer. We're talking about the minister now. Titus was a minister. And this is a pastoral epistle. And he said, peace unto you. Before we go on, I told you that um, truth and mercy are inseparably joined together. The same thing, peace and righteousness are inseparably linked together. You know, if somebody is uh, living a kind of a sinful life, a defeated life, there'll be no peace in the heart. There will be confusion in the heart And there is going to be the accusation of the devil The person cannot help you There will be turmoil in the heart But you want to understand That peace and righteousness Are joined together inseparably If we are looking at uh, Psalm 85 verse 10 Psalm 85 uh, We are reading from verse 10 in Psalm 85 verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Look at this. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Isaiah chapter 32. We're reading from verse 17. Isaiah chapter 32 verse 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. You see how they are joined together? And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever and then we're looking at some sorry Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18 righteousness and peace joined together in Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18 oh that they had hearkened to my commandments then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea righteousness and peace together in romans chapter 14 verse 17 romans chapter 14 we're reading from verse 17 you see the peace of god as well as the righteousness it says in verse 17 romans chapter 14 for the kingdom of god is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace righteousness and peace and joy in the holy ghost in uh, hebrews uh, chapter 12 verse 11 hebrews chapter 12 we're reading from verse 11, righteousness and peace. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 11, hear what it says now. Not just tinning for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterward, it yielded, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now we come to this uh, peace that uh, Paul the Apostle prayed for the uh, minister. That he prayed for Titus as he wrote to Titus and showed the ministration as well as the prayer, the intercession to Titus. My own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. This piece we are talking about is for the minister, peculiarly for the minister. And it is uh, a sort of piece that in the challenges of ministry, there is a person who was a minister of God, who have the peace of God. This is not the peace that an indolent person can claim. Somebody sitting down in the house, somebody lying down on the bed. This is for the challenging, dynamic, ongoing up ministry. And because it's a ministry, it's going to meet quite a lot of things. And such a minister needs, he needs, uh, you know, the peace of God so that he can remain calm, cool and composed amidst the Grecian conflicting lies and opposition of subversive people. There were so many in the Grecian community and when he made appointments and some people would not understand the appointment he needed the peace of God. In times of a new challenges on the new field we need that mercy of God and we need that uh, peace of God and we need the grace of God. What does that uh, peace do? In Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah chapter 26 reading from verse 3 in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 it says thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. He'll keep you in perfect peace. Whose mind is staged on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. If you're a minister, many things will happen. You'll hear some you know, people gossiping about you. You'll hear of some people saying that all your good intentions and all your good work, well, you are doing it for that reason, you are doing it for that reason. They might misunderstand your action and misunderstand the good things you're doing. If you're not having the peace of God, you'll be ruffled. You'll be confused. You'll be unhappy. You'll take some other things. Okay, if that is the way they think, and they think I'm doing it for this reason, I'll not do it anymore. You are not serving them, you are serving God. I said you are not serving them, you are serving God. And haven't you seen at the back of those lorries, uh, you know, going to the village, it says, Let them say. Can you help me shout? Let them say. Whatever they say, let them say. And then you have the peace of God in you because your mind is staged on God. I pray that that peace will never leave you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 37, Psalm 37, and we're looking at verse 37. You can't forget this one. 37, 37, 37, 37. In Psalm 37, we're looking at verse, what's the verse? 37, mark the perfect man. That's the safe, sanctified man. Mark the perfect man. That's the man that lost God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, and all his strength. Mark the perfect man. That's the man that wants to consecrate and give everything his God to the work of God. And he just follows the work of God. He's forgotten his own work. He's abandoned his own work. He's still doing it, but you know, he's, he's making that the second thing. He's making the work of God as number one. And the Lord looks looks at him and smiles from heaven and says, that's my son, that's my daughter. I pray you'll qualify for that. It says, mark, mark the perfect man and, up, and behold the upright for the end of that man, tell me, is peace. The end of that man is peace. That's what Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, John chapter 14, I'm reading here from verse 27. John chapter 14, we're reading from verse 27. Peace I leave with you. You go home with peace tonight. Greater peace in your heart. When you're sleeping, there'll be peace in your heart. All those nightmares, everything will vanish away. You will not sleep with confusion. You're not going to sleep with a turmoil in your heart. Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. You hear stories, let not your heart be troubled. You hear gossips, let not your heart be troubled. You hear some contradictory things about yourself. Did they say that about me? Tell me more. What are you telling them to tell you more? Even the ones you have heard is disturbing your mind and disturbing your rest and disturbing your peace. Let the gossiper leave you. Let those tell bearers, don't let them come near you. So you can retain the peace of God. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The Lord will keep your heart in peace. 
in uh, John chapter 16 verse 33 John chapter 16 verse 33 it says these things I've spoken unto you that in me ye might have what are you going to have peace in Christ stay in Christ abide in Christ remain in Christ don't ever shift your position you are born again you have come into the kingdom stay there and you have gone deeper into the experience of you are sanctified stay there and now you are filled and you are overflowing with the Holy Ghost stay there and it says uh, in the world you shall have tribulation trouble trial temptation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world and that victory will be yours in Jesus Jesus name. Uh, you, you see, look at uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 15. It says what the peace of God will do. The peace of God. The peace of God. And thank God, you can maintain this every time. If you are not looking at people, you are not thinking about people, you are not thinking about circumstances, you are thinking about the love of God for you every time. And you keep your mind, you keep your heart on Christ every time. Look at uh, chapter 3 and verse 15, Colossians. It says, let the peace of God do what? Rule in your hearts. Let you be the king in your heart, the ruler in your heart, the dictator, if you please, in your heart. The one that, uh, you know, dictates to you, think of this, don't think of that. Go this way, don't go that way. Talk about this, don't talk about that. Meditate on this, don't meditate on that other thing. It says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye also are called in one body, and be thankful. And you thankful you are a worker? And you're thankful you're a minister. And you're thankful you're doing something that even the angels in heaven are not allowed to do. Look at that verse 15 again. Let, tell, what is that? Tell me out aloud. The peace of God. We're going to look at another aspect now. The God of peace. We've seen the peace of God. You know, if in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, the peace of God is resident there. And it's the one controlling. It's the one directing. It's the one uh, counseling. It's the one influencing you. And the peace of God is ruling in your heart. Turn it around. Let's see what the God of peace will do. This peace of God, Titus, I'm praying for you that the peace of God will come to you and the God of peace will reign over your life in Jesus name look at Romans chapter 16 God of peace, the God of peace, the God of peace Romans chapter uh, chapter what? chapter 16, what's the verse? verse 20 verse 20, look at this and the God of peace shall bull Satan under your feet shortly in your house, the God of peace shall bull Satan under your feet shortly an emergency arises over your wife, over your husband. An emergency arises over your child. An emergency arises anywhere you are because you are a minister. And because the Lord is watching over you. It says the God of peace, leave it to him. God will deal with that Satan. He'll deal with that challenge. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Uh, we're coming to you. We're coming to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Peace of God, God of peace. Peace of God and the God of peace. It says in uh, Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7. It says, And the peace of God, this is the peace of God now, which passes all understanding. Everywhere is in commotion. It's like wave on the sea. It's like storm on the sea. But you are calm. But you are cool. But you are composed. But you have the peace of God. Nothing bothers you. Give me a good amen. amen. Because you know everything will be alright. I said everything will be alright. Because the peace of God which passes your understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Verse 9, those things which, that which ye have learned, both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And tell me, the God of peace shall be with you. 
verse 7 is a piece of God that passes all understanding. As you think of the right thing in verse 9, the God of peace shall be with me. I said with me. With you in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He's going to do something in your life tonight. The promise of God must be fulfilled in your life. And all this that we're talking about, the abundance of the grace of God and the overflowing mercy of God and the present uh, mercy and the peace of God must be in your heart today in a greater measure in Jesus' name. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 20, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, now, now, if you are there, tell me now what? The God of peace. You are not there yet. Hebrews, what's the chapter? And what's the verse? Verse 20, open it and let's, let's enjoy this together. Now, tell me. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make who? I said who? You can be perfect. Your life will be perfect. The work of your hand will be perfected. Your joy will be perfected. Everything concerning you will be perfected in Jesus' name. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will. Walking in you, that which is well pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Yes. Amen. Grace do you need that? It has, it has been supplied. Mercy, do you need that? It has been supplied. Peace, do you need that? In abundant measure, it has been supplied. Grace and mercy and peace be unto you. From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Rise up and claim more of that grace and more of that peace and more of that mercy of God. Rise up and let us pray.